we're talking on this program each day about the meaning of life. Uh, that is why you're here, or why I'm here, uh, what the point of it all is. And we've done a lot of basic discussions over the past eight or nine months on what we think was the origin of life and why we think we're here. And the basic uh, premise that we're starting on is that we are here because we were made by a personal being who is at least as personable as we are and who has made us because he wants people whom he can love and who will love him. And so we have been made to share a friendship with the creator of the universe. And that's why you're here. You're not just a, a little uh, chance deviation thrown up by a mass of protons and neutrons in an impersonal evolutionary process. Though there may well be some evolution in the universe, yet there has to have been someone who gave that evolution direction and who programmed into it a purposeful development. And so what we've concluded is that you are here because the person who made you actually loves you and wants you to be his friend. And moreover, you are the only version of you that exists. There's nobody else like you. Never will be, never has been. So in a very real way, if you don't come through uh, to a relationship, a friendship with your maker, he misses something. You, of course, miss everything. But that's what we've been talking about. And now we've reached the point where we're discussing how this works out this plan for us to become like our creator through doing what he has put us here on earth to do, how this plan works out in regard to our ordinary personalities. And we're doing that because many of us, though we've read all kinds of psychological books and books on temperament and books on how to develop into wonderful, fully integrated people, yet many of us are still bewildered and baffled because the sheer fragmentation of knowledge in our present generation makes it almost impossible for us to synthesize these thoughts into one complete whole or system. And so that's what we're trying to do. On the basis of what the son of the maker of the universe explained to us was reality. And so we are uh, going back to that old book that many of us have sitting on our shelves gathering dust, that book that is known as Tab Biblia in Greek. It means the books, the collection of books. And of course, the Tab Biblia, the Greek word has become our English word Bible. So we are taking some of our basis from that book. And what we've reached, the point we've reached in our discussion is that we've talked about three levels of our personality. One body, two soul, three spirit. And we started to talk about our spirits as the only part of us that really is able to contact God. Now we're talking about the soul, which in Greek is the word suke and becomes, of course, in our English, psyche. And part of all those words like psychological, psychiatry, etc., etc. And that's the part of us that is, in a sense, particularly human. You may remember us going back to the early history of mankind, where in the Bible and those early chapters that are actually historical, you know, they're not just bluff old fantasy. Uh, you read the verse, and God took dust from the ground and made our bodies. And then he breathed into our bodies the breath of life, and that was his own spirit. And then that combined with the body, and man became, it says, a living soul, Hebrew word nephesh. And our soul is actually the part of us that makes us uniquely human, the spirits, uh, are like angels, the angels of spirits. The animals have bodies, but only man has a soul in the sense that we have a soul. We often look into our dog's eyes and think, oh, he's thinking the same thing as us, but we realize quite well he isn't. We're just projecting into our thoughts. But the soul is the unique part 
that makes us human beings as opposed to either spirits or animals. And part of the soul that we discussed yesterday was the mind. The soul in the uh, Bible uh, has a reference to the mind and is used often where we would use mind. I don't know if you know a, an old book uh, in the Old Testament called Proverbs, but it is really good and you should read it, you know, at uh, times. It's, it's good. And there's a piece of it that runs like this in Proverbs 3 and verse uh, 21 and 22. My son... Keep sound wisdom and discretion. Uh, let them not escape from your sight, and there will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. Uh, and so there, there is reference clearly to sound wisdom and discretion, the ability to judge and decide and reason and evaluate. Those are some of the functions of the mind. And you can see that there, they're referred to the soul. They will be life for your soul. So one function of your soul is your mind, your intellectual ability to evaluate and decide and judge things. And of course, what we said yesterday was many of us think the mind is the way into truth, but it's not actually. The mind simply is able to examine and evaluate what is presented to it, but it is limited to what is presented to it. And the mind itself actually is finite and cannot gather all the infinite knowledge that is in the world. And you remember we used the example of the guy that said, oh, there is no God. We've now got our astronauts up in space. They have looked and they haven't found him. He isn't there. And the other guy replied, have they looked everywhere? Well, of course they haven't looked everywhere because they can't look everywhere because we can't see to the end of space. That's part of the limitation of the mind. The mind is the is the ability that you have to perceive relations and correlates. That is, similarities between things and differences between things, and to evaluate them in the light of certain premises. But it is limited to what is presented to it. Now, another function of the soul is the function of emotions. Your soul has emotions, and you can find that in all kinds of places uh, mentioned in that old book, the Bible, but your emotions are the part of you that feels. You know, with your emotions, you feel affection for people. Uh, with your emotions, you feel strong desire for things or for other people or for experiences. With your emotions, you have simple feelings, feelings of anger or hatred or joy uh, feelings of liking a person or disliking a person. It's in your emotions where your feelings about people and about circumstances and even about things are experienced. So your emotions are a powerful part of you, more especially so because they're connected with the body. You know how when you're very nervous, then you begin to feel your mouth dry. And that's because your emotions begin to stop the secretion of fluids in your mouth. It's the same when you feel fear and your hands grow clammy. It's because your emotions are very directly connected with your body and they cause your palm, the palms of your hands to actually perspire. Or it's the same if you're very embarrassed and you blush, what happens is you, the emotion of embarrassment sends messages to your blood vessels and they release more flow of blood in your cheeks and you blush. So your emotions are probably the strongest part of your soul. Your body, actually, you can guess, is the strongest part of you. But your soul is the next strong the next strongest part of you especially your emotions because they're connected with your physical body of course you can see yourself uh, right there the great uh, foolishness and mistake of going by your emotions because your emotions are so influenced by your body that what almost whatever you do in your body affects your emotions 
that's the ridiculous part, of course, of uh, any of us thinking that we kind of find God in our emotions. I mean, some of us uh, think we're super intellectual and we'll find truth through our minds. Well, you can't because the mind is limited to what is presented to it. But we, many of us think, oh, well, we're not very intellectual, but we can feel God. Well, of course, you can see that your feelings are almost utterly dictated by your body. And you'll never find God through your feelings. Let's talk a little more about the soul tomorrow and its functions.